The Bible gives us priorities for our life. God's word teaches us how we're to live according to God's priorities. And when our priorities are in order according to God's word, then all the rest of our life fits into place. And so in this current message series, we're looking at four priorities for life. Four of God's top priorities. We started with the top priority of loving God. Our relationship with God is our most important priority. And currently, we're looking at our second priority of loving the Word of God, loving God's Word, the revelation that God has given to us about Himself. It has it written down for us to read. And today, we're going to be talking about loving the truth of God's Word. Now, sometimes we use these words interchangeably and don't really think about it. We talk about the Bible. That's a fine name. We talk about Scripture, and we talk about God's Word. They're all synonymous, but... I like God's word or the word of God because it says that what we have in this book that we have is actually the word of God. It's actually been inspired by God. It's written down. It's God's revelation to us about himself. And as such, it contains or is God's truth. It is the truth of God. I can say unequivocally that God's word is 100% true. There is no error in the word of God. And no other book can make the same claim. The Bible itself makes the claim in Psalm 119, verse 160. I'd encourage you to pull out the white page in the middle of your bulletin. It has the outline of the message here, as well as the verses written out. It has a study guide on the back. Some further questions that you can dig in a little deeper in your life group or by yourself. Psalm 119, 160 says, All your words are true. All your righteous laws are eternal. There's two words repeated there, or one word repeated twice. It's all. Circle the word all. All of God's word is true. That means every last word contained in God's word is true. We don't have to look at this. I wonder if this is true, and this sounds good to me, and so this must be true, but I don't like what this says, so that's not true. All of God's word is true. God's word, which is His righteous laws are eternal. That's incredible, isn't it? The truth of God's word is going to last forever. What's true today has been true in the past and is true forever and ever. The truth never stops being true. Now, what kind of truth are we talking about? Well, the dictionary defines truth as the thing that corresponds to fact or reality. What is true is something that corresponds to fact or reality. And so truth corresponds with reality the way things really are. There is a reality. We come to this with the assumption with the, uh, with the assumption that, that there is a reality that can be known. And truth corresponds with that reality. Truth is therefore absolute. What is true for me is true true for you as well, because truth corresponds to reality. Truth exists in the physical realm, in the realm of mathematics. Two plus two, it's not five, it's not six, it's not three, it's four. Two plus two is four. It's true for me, it's true for my kids. They've learned that, we've taught them well, and it's true for everyone at all times. The same is true, the law of gravity, it's true for everyone at all times. It's true whether you believe it or not. If you stumble on the top of stairs, the law of gravity will make sure that you meet the bottom of the stairs. You're not going to fly up, you're going to go down because of the law of gravity. It's true whether you believe it or not, it's true across all the face of this planet. The truth of God's word is a spiritual truth. But it's an absolute truth as well. And so the truth of God's word corresponds to a spiritual reality. It corresponds to the reality of God himself. God has revealed information about himself in his word. And that information that he has revealed is true. It corresponds exactly to the reality of who God is and what he is like. 
The truth of God's word is also an exclusive truth. Jesus said in John 14, 6, he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Notice Jesus said, I'm the truth. And then he said, no one comes through the Father except through me. In other words, no one can come to God by any other religion. It's not possible. It's only through Jesus Christ. Now, does that make people happy? It doesn't make people happy, does it? They think it's not fair. Who are you to say that Jesus is the only way? Well, Jesus himself said it. I, I didn't say it. I'm just reading what Jesus said. I'm reading what God's word has to say. And so our culture, because they don't like these exclusive claims of the word of God, they've come up with something which is called relative truth. And relative truth says that one thing can be true for me and another thing can be true for you. You can believe that, I can believe that, and hey, we'll just get along, everything will be hunky-dory, even though our beliefs are completely contradictory. And so they say, you can believe in Jesus, I can believe in Allah. You can believe in Jesus, I can believe in Buddha or whatever, and each one of us can find our own way to God. Well, to put it bluntly, that kind of talk makes no sense at all. Because God is real, he has a reality, and he has shown us the way to himself. And so he can't be the God of the Bible and the God of the Koran at the same time because they're described as different gods. They're very different. And so the truth of spiritual laws is just as real as the truth of physical laws. Spiritual truth corresponds, things that are true spiritually correspond to the reality of spiritual things, the nature of God and who he is. God's word is true. If God's word is true and there's convincing evidence that it is, then other religions are false. You can't believe whatever you want to. You must believe in the truth because the truth is what corresponds to reality. I'd like us to watch a video clip about absolute truth, which the Bible teaches, and relative truth, which uh, some people try to believe in. It's called truth refocused. Now, you're going to have to focus to catch this clip because the guy talks really, really fast, much faster than I do. So, Two, three, focus. So get ready and focus. Okay, you got that all? All right. And so God's word reveals the absolute truth about God. It's true for everyone. It's true at all times. Now this whole concept of relative truth has permeated the church as well. People say things like all denominations, all churches that call themselves Christian should be accepted as Christian because who are we to judge? If one church believes the Bible says X, another church believes the Bible says Y, then it really doesn't matter. You can believe whatever you want the Bible to say. God understands. Now what's wrong with that view is that we do have a standard for the truth. It is the Bible. The Bible doesn't say different things to different people at different times. God gave us the Bible to teach us the absolute truth. It doesn't mean X to person A and Y to person B. It means what it says. And those that understand the Bible and interpret it properly can come to understand the truth of God's word. God gave us the Bible not to confuse us, but to teach us the truth. It can be understood. And through his spirit, we can know the absolute truth of what the word of God teaches if one church teaches it says this, another church teaches it says that, then one church is right and another church is wrong. They can't all be right. They can't all be true. And so we need to look at God's word to find out what it really says, what the truth is. In our message today, we're going to look at a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, warning him against false teachers in the church. And there's a lot of warnings in the New Testament about false teachers in the church, false teachers who who taught that the Bible said one thing, but it was not true. They were teaching falsehood. And God's word shows that they were leading people astray. And so Paul is going to show us the truth of God's word. It's our standard to discern the difference between truth and falsehood. 
And so first of all, the truth of God's word, it warns us. Our passage is taken from 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. And says, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. Now you might think, well, maybe the last days are off in the future. Well, as we read this passage, as we read all of the New Testament teaching on the last days, we find out that the last days began when Jesus rose from the dead and ascended into heaven, and they continue until he returns. And so where does that put us? Smack dab in the middle of the last days. In fact, the listeners or readers of Paul's letter of 2 Timothy, including Timothy himself, were in the last days. It's been lasting for 2,000 plus years, and it's going to last until Jesus returns again. But we don't know when that's going to be. If anybody tells you they know when Jesus is going to return, as a false teacher, God's word says you can't know when he's going to return. During these last days, there's going to be terrible or difficult times. Jesus warned us about difficult times that were going to come in the last days. He talked of disasters, of earthquakes, of uh, storms, all marking the last, uh, the last days. But the terrible times that Paul here is warning us about have to do with people, people who do not live by God's truth, people who promote false teaching, people who promote things that are contrary to what the Word of God teaches. And so the truth of God's Word warns, warns against, and I'll classify these as selfish people. And so in the last days, in these terrible times of the last days, it says that people will be lovers of themselves. That's the first characteristic. They'll be lovers of money. They'll be boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Count those up, 18 characteristics of people who do not accept the truth of God's word. It seems to me that 18 comes from three sixes, 666, six, six, the number of man. Self-centered man, it's all about me. People who are lovers of themselves, selfish, self-centered. Lately, what's the classic example? Classic example has to do with smartphones. It may be any place, what's it all about? That's about my selfie, okay? It's all about me. I could be anywhere and I take a selfie and it's all about me and I send it to all my friends. Look at me. Self-centered lovers of themselves. And now you'll never take another selfie, right? <clears throat> a selfish person is a greedy person. He's a lover of money. That's the root, the Bible says, of all kinds of evil. And we don't have time to go through all these ungodly characteristics, but you can see, you can recognize them in our society and our culture as being prevalent. Each one is opposed to the truth of what God's Word teaches. Let's look at the last characteristic. It, I think it sums up all the rest. It says that people will be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. What is pleasure? It's pleasing yourself. That's what people want to do. That's what you know, what's life all about? It's about having fun. It's about pleasing myself rather than pleasing God. Loving, lovers of themselves, lovers of pleasure. People spend more time entertaining themselves than loving God and His Word. These kind of people create churches that cater to what people want. How they want to be entertained rather than focusing on the truth that God requires in worship. So what should our response be to those kind of people? Well, God's word says, stay away from those who oppose the truth. Verse 5, it says, they have a form of godliness, denying, but denying its power, have nothing to do with them. And so the people that Paul is talking about here, the people he's warning Timothy against, are not people who say, I'm an atheist, I want nothing to do with God. These are people who have a form of godliness. In other words, they give an outward appearance of being a Christian, outward appearance of being a believer, but they deny the power of the Holy Spirit. They deny the power of God to work miracles today. They deny the power of God to change lives. And God's word warns us to have nothing to do with them. 
But so what's the main issue with these kinds of people? Verse 7 and 8. It says, Always learning, but never able to acknowledge what? The truth. These men oppose the truth. Men of depraved minds who, as far as the faith is concerned, are rejected. And so they appear to have knowledge. They appear to understand the truth of God's word. But in, in fact, they are actually opposing the truth of God's word. even while claiming to teach from the very truth that they oppose. And so their minds are not able to live by the truth, and it says they've been rejected by God. In other words, they're not believers, even though they may claim to be on the surface. And so God's word warns us against such people and against allowing those characteristics, the 18 characteristics we've read about, from taking root in our own lives. These things all tempt us. And God doesn't want those things to be part of our lives. And so all these verses that we've read, these first eight verses in 2 Timothy chapter 3, there's one command, and it is have nothing to do with them or those kind of people. In other words, have nothing to do with people who have those 18 characteristics that we read about. Now when you read that, say, well, you know, let's say what person. Now let's broaden our thinking a little bit. What does that mean? Have nothing to do with them. How do we encounter people like that? Where do we encounter people like that? It's not just one on one. It's not just somebody you bump into. You encounter people like that. People who oppose the truth. When you watch television. Anybody encountered anybody with any of those characteristics when you watch the television show? That doesn't take long. Okay. On the internet, anybody ever seen on the internet that something or a person that opposed the truth or wrote something opposing the truth? In books, in magazines, in movies, in the words of songs that we listen to, have nothing to do with them and their depravity. What about face to face? What about people you know? Perhaps some are wondering, how can I witness to people like that? What if that person is in my own family? Or what if they're a relative? Well, I can't answer all the questions this morning, but the reason we're commanded to have nothing to do with these kind of people is so that the evil, the falsehood, the lies that are in these people's lives, so it doesn't contaminate us. So it doesn't affect us. The Bible teaches us you become like those you fellowship with. You become like those you hang around with. You say, well, it won't affect me. Well, it will affect you. That's why we need to stay away from those kind of people so that you're not influenced by their evil. Now, these are people who are opposed to the truth. These are people who are not open to the gospel, not open to the truth of God's word. Now, through prayer, such a person's heart may change. The Bible doesn't say we shouldn't pray for such people. But we don't hang around them a lot. Now, there are other people who are not believers, but they're open to discussing the truth of God's word. They're open to talking about the Bible. Those people are people we can develop deeper relationships with. Those are people that we can witness to on a deeper level. If you look at the life of Jesus, you can see how he interacted with different types of people. There were sinners that he went out to dinner with. Why? Because they wanted to hear what he had to say. They were open to hearing the truth from Jesus. They wanted a change in their lives. And there were others that he had nothing to do with. Often these were the religious types. They thought they had it all together. They thought they knew everything about God's word. And Jesus said they don't know God at all. And he didn't have anything to do with those people. Just look at Jesus. Some people he hung out with. Other people he had absolutely nothing to do with. And so the truth of God's word warns us about who we keep company with, both in person and via electronic means today for the most part or even reading books we need to be very very careful 
Not only does the truth of God's word warns, it, it protects as well. The truth of God's word protects. 2 Timothy 3.10 You, however, know all about my teaching. Now, the letter of Timothy is Paul writing to Timothy. My way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance. And so Paul then gives some characteristics of his own life, the life of a true believer in Jesus Christ. And you can see that these characteristics are the exact opposites of the previous list we just looked at. His teaching, his way of life, his purpose, his faith, patience, love, and endurance. Seven characteristics. Seven is the number of God. And what's going to happen when you live life by following the truth of God's word? You're going to be blessed, yes. But what does this say? All who live by God's truth will be persecuted. Let's stand up and shout hallelujah, right? Verse 12, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now circle that word, everyone. Does that include you? Are you an everyone? Okay, if you desire or want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, you will be persecuted. Let's put it another way. If you aren't being persecuted, are you living a godly life? Maybe nobody knows. You know, if, you don't, if you're a secret agent Christian, Maybe you won't be persecuted, but that's not the kind of Christian God calls you to be. He says, don't hide your light under a bushel. Don't be a secret agent Christian that nobody knows. Let your light shine so that the world knows. And if you let that happen, you're going to be persecuted. Now, why would those who live a godly life, why would they be persecuted? Because they're living by the truth of God's word. And they're going to be persecuted by those who live according to <coughs> according to falsehood, according to lies. And so the false believers that we talked about uh, hate true believers. They're going to take advantage of them. <clears throat> They're going to persecute them whenever they get the chance. But the good news is that God rescues those who stand for the truth. I turn the verses around a little bit, but Paul in verse 11 is going on from verse 10 talking about the characteristics of his life. And he talked about his faith, patience, love, and endurance. And then he says his persecutions and sufferings. Those were characteristics of Paul's life. What kind of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, the persecutions I endured? And yet, the Lord rescued me from all of them. The Lord rescued him. And so besides the good things Paul had in his life, he also encountered persecution. He also encountered suffering. But Jesus Christ rescued him from everything. Everything that the devil threw at him, everything that uh, false teachers or believers threw at him, he was rescued from. And so even though you and I will encounter persecution in life in one form or another, if we desire to live by God's truth, if we live by uh, God's way, God will protect us and rescue us. He'll provide a way for escape so that we can continue his work through our lives. And there's the verse, a quick late, but what we're talking about here is the clash between two kingdoms. We have the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan, and they're in constant warfare. If you're a believer, you're in the kingdom of God. If you're not, you're in the kingdom of Satan. It's a clash between the kingdom of light, the kingdom of darkness, between the kingdom of truth and the kingdom of falsehood. They're always in conflict. The false kingdom will always persecute those in the kingdom of God. And sometimes the kingdom of darkness, actually, the Bible says, cloaks itself in light. It will appear to be, to deceive people, part of the kingdom of light. Or a certain person will will act like a believer or like a true teacher of God. But if you look carefully, the fruit or characteristics of that person, that teaching or that church are going to reveal the true character underneath. And so we need to heed these warnings for our own lives. We need to heed these warnings for our families. 
And we must warn others who are being led astray from the truth of God's word. And the only way we can live in that protection, the protection of God's word, is if we know God's word. If we study it for ourselves. If we listen to teaching that is true, that is from God's word, and we boldly tell others of that truth. God wants each of us to be sharing God's word with others daily. And just as all the blessings of technology we have can be used by the kingdom of falsehood with their views disseminated across the internet in every other way, so we can spread the truth of God's word in the same way. Well, you can do that through your conversations you have face-to-face -face with friends, co-workers, neighbors. You can do it through emails. You can do it through Facebook posts. You know, you can spread the truth of God's word through a Facebook post. You can post a verse. You can post something that God has showed you through the church family, through a message. Why not tell others about something you've learned? Don't cover it up. We talk about everything else on our Facebook, right? A few people said yes. Yes, you do. I know. <laughs> Why not talk about the truth of God's word? Ask God to help you to share his truth courageously. Now, if you start posting the truth about God's word on your Facebook, you might get a little persecution. In a comment here or there. Is that going to be the worst thing in the world? No, it means... You're doing something good. You're doing something right. If you're doing something good, doing something right, you're going to get a little pushback. You don't want to be obnoxious about it, but God will help you to draw the line correctly. So ask God to help you to share his truth courageously. Not only does God's word protect, it also equips. The truth of God's word equips us. Verse 14, Paul says to Timothy, As for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it. And so this verse is saying that the character of those who teach God's word is just as important as the truth of God's word. And so when you hear somebody say, you know, it really doesn't matter what I've done, it doesn't matter what I do in my private life, it just matters what... Uh, you know, I say what I tell you to do, watch out. That's a red flag. There's something wrong with that person. Uh, most likely they're a false teacher. You can't trust the teaching of somebody whose life has the characteristic of a false teacher. And so God's word equips the believer, first of all, because faith in God's word saves. Verse 15, this is how from infancy you've known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Now we learn elsewhere that Timothy had been raised by a godly grandmother, a godly mother. He'd been raised knowing the scripture. They taught him the truth of the Bible from little on. And this verse tells us that the truth of God's word combined with faith in Jesus Christ is able to bring a person to salvation. And that's really the first step to knowing uh, the truth of Jesus Christ. Being saved from sin and falsehood is that very first step to walking in the truth of God's word. But next, God's word equips us for good works. Verse 16 and 17, a very well-known pair of verses, a good one to memorize. It says, all, God, all scripture, which is God's word, is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now we're back to the word all again, aren't we? Underline that phrase, all scripture. All scripture, all of God's word, not just part of it, not just some of it, not just the part I like, not just the part that's not controversial, but all of scripture, all of God's word is God breathed. It's inspired by God. It means that God directed the men writing it so that his truth was conveyed to us accurately, a truth that can be known. So don't listen to people who say, oh, there's so many translations. You can't know what God's word means. Yes, you can. Well, we have the original Greek and Hebrew texts. We can know what God's word says. 
God is the author of his word and all of the Bible is useful for teaching, for training, not just part of it, all of it. And we like those aspects. I want to be taught. I want to be trained. The Bible is also useful for rebuking and correcting. How many people like to be rebuked and corrected? Okay, there's three of us. I won't go into what Proverbs says if you don't like rebuking and correcting what type of person you are. Some of you can figure that out. We need to be rebuked and corrected when our thinking is contrary to the truth of God's word. And there's aspects of our, every one of our thinking that is not 100% in keeping with God's word. And so we need a little correction. We need a little rebuking from time to time so that our thinking and our actions in our life get in line with the absolute truth of God's word. Now, what is the purpose of all Scripture for the believer? The purpose of all Scripture is to equip us to do something. To equip the man of God, to equip the women of, woman of God for every good work. Good work is what God has planned for you to do for your life before the creation of the world. God thought you up before the world began. He knew he was going to create you. And he created something for you to do. You're not just to wander and meander through life aimlessly. You have work to do. As long as you're alive, as long as you're breathing, God has something for you to do. And it's good work. It's not bad work. It's good work. And the word of God is there to equip you to do the good work you were created to do. Now, can God fulfill his purpose for your life without his word? And I believe the answer is absolutely not. It's only through knowing, understanding, and following God's word that we can do the good works that God has planned us, planned for us to do. And so God's word equips us to share the truth of his word with other people, uh, which will ultimately lead them to salvation and to understanding God's word and being equipped to share his truth with yet others. And so the cycle goes on and on. And so as believers, we must be convinced of the absolute truth of God's word. It's a truth for us. It's the truth for our nation. It's the truth for the peoples of every nation on the planet. We don't have one truth and the people in Africa or the people in the Middle East have another truth. It is God's absolute truth for everyone, everywhere, at all times. And for those who have not yet heard the truth of God's word, it is our task, it is part of our good work to do everything we can to send that truth, the truth of God's word, to them. To send the truth of God's word to every corner of the globe. And we do that through missions in many other ways. We need to heed the warnings of God's word concerning those who oppose the truth. Those who oppose the truth will persecute us if we let God's truth uh, be shared through our lives. But God will protect us from those attacks. And finally, the truth of God's word equips us to do good work. The good work that God has created us to do. So let's learn and love the truth of God's word so that we can spread it to our world. Now today, if you're not sure that you know Jesus, who said he was the way, the truth, and the life, he said that no one comes to the Father except through him. And so Jesus is the only way to have a relationship with God. Jesus is the only way to have eternal life that is going to last forever when one day you pass on. He is the only way. If you're not sure you have a relationship with him, if you're not sure that he is your Lord and Savior, we're going to pray a simple prayer right now. And in that prayer, we're going to admit that we've sinned. And that sin has separated us from a holy God. We're going to believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross, that our sins might be forgiven, and that through faith in him, we can have a relationship with God. And finally, we're going to commit ourselves to believing in Jesus Christ and following his word all the days of our lives. So let's bow our heads right now. I'd like to encourage you to join with me in praying this prayer if you're not sure that you know Jesus Christ. Say, Father, today, 
I thank you for your word. And I acknowledge that I've sinned. I've done wrong things. I admit it. Things that are contrary to the truth of your word. Things that your word says that are wrong. Please forgive me. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross. Took my sins upon himself. Paid the price that I might be forgiven. Come into my life. I commit myself to following you as my Lord and my Savior. I want to do the good works that you have created me to do. In Jesus' name. And for those of us who are believers, let's pray that God would help us to love the truth of his word in even greater degree. Father, we thank you for the absolute truth of your word. We thank you that your word applies to everyone at all times in every place. Help us, God, to take a stand for the truth of your word against the relative, relativistic truth around us in our society and culture. We thank you, God, for warning us about the characteristics of those who oppose your truth. And we pray, God, that we would stay away from the influence of those kind of people in our lives and in our families. Help us to be lovers of God rather than lovers of ourselves or lovers of pleasure. Help us to put you first and foremost in our lives. We make a commitment, God, today to sharing this truth, the truth of your word, the truth that applies to everyone with no exception, to sharing that truth with everyone that we come in contact with, with everyone that we have any influence with. And God, we thank you that you're going to protect us, you're going to rescue us from the persecution that's going to come our way as we share your truth. Help us to be equipped with the truth of your word so that we can do the good work that you created us to do. So that we can fulfill the purpose, God, that you have for our lives. Give us the courage, God, to share your truth in all the ways that you've made available to us, that you've given us to communicate in. God, we pray that lives will be touched as we share the truth in love. Help us to share your truth, not offensively, but help us to share your truth with a loving heart, to help other people, to help people see who you really are. And I pray, God, that this church will be a growing example of your truth uh, in the St. Louis area. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.